Okay. So I was thinking, uh, just to start off, I mm. give a little background for anyone who's watching this, but really I'm just keen to dive into a conversation with you, Joan. Okay. Um, and the background uh, is we met quite some years ago at a science and non-duality conference, I think, the first time. We did. I mean, I was aware of your work before that, but that's where we met. That's where we met, yes. And we had yes. a great conversation. I really remember enjoying that and going for a walk yeah. with you. And then more recently, we've connected and been sending messages to each other and um, had some interesting things come up about each, how we were perceiving things and how things were changing. And so I suggested we we did one of these. So in the tradition of this, I'd like to start off with a kind of a just a starting place with you, um, which is to say, um, you know, what you know, what, you've been around the block, you've been here for a while. Uh, what do you, <laughs> what what do you think this is that we're experiencing, and and what have you made of it, and where have you, where have you got to so far? Well, I think my most profound realization is that. The old, I'm 75, the older I get, the less I know, hmm. and the less certain I am of what I know. <laughs> and um, and I think we really have no idea what's going on here. I mean, we have many ideas, but I would say nobody really knows what's going on here. And one of the things that I appreciated about you from before I met you um, was how in your books, you always say, this is how I'm seeing it now but I might change my mind. And then you've done that a number of times. And, um, and, um, and I've done that too. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, my, my background sort of, it, there was Zen first, Soto Zen. And then there was Tony Packer who had been a Zen teacher, but left sort of, um, she was very much, um, she and Krishnamurti were very much on the same kind of wavelength, I would say. And so I was with her. She was kind of my main teacher. And then I got into Advaita with people like John Klein and Gangaji and a whole host of satsang Advaita teachers. So I kind of have roots in all these different places. And all of that has kind of shown up in my perspective. And... Um, You know, I, I would say that um, what matters to me most, I oh, think. <laughs> that was, that's incredible. I was here going, I want to ask Joan, now at 75, <laughs> what actually matters to you? And you just went, what matters to me most is. Yeah. So well, I, shouldn't, I do feel like we're not, I, I have a strong feeling when I'm talking to people that we're not in separate bubbles of consciousness, that, yeah, we're, me too. that we're in the same stream somehow. Yeah. I don't know that's just a, um, a strong sense. And, and I also have a very strong sense of the, of the sort of oneness of everything or the undividedness of everything or the seamlessness of everything or the interconnectedness and interdependency of everything, however you want to language it. Um, so what matters to me most, I think, is just being awake in this moment right now, you know, and appreciating the beauty and whatever's here and the simple things of life, like, a cup of coffee or a morning walk or mm. talking to a friend. Um, I think that's, you know, that's very important to me. And, um, and there's definitely, you know, I feel a, a deep longing or pull, if you will, um, to kind of to, to be awake as this open boundless presence and to bring love into the world rather than anger and hate and <laughs> conflict which i often fail at but um i have that aspiration or that longing you could say and then i i notice there's a kind of other longing in me if you want to call it a longing a little bit mischievous kind of or maybe it's my doubting voice my doubting app my doubt app or whatever <laughs> but you know kind of like it's the me that was once a drunk and a kind of belligerent um you know, troublesome drunk um, that that kind of wants to, um, you know, fuck all this, it's all crazy kind of thing. <laughs> and I think there's 
something in there that's kind of both pathological and also um, healthy. It's kind of got both dimensions in it, that particular sort of side of me. Um, it's a side of me that can get angry and all that. So there's that. And, um, and I just, you know, I read different things and listen to different things. And I've, of course, listened to some of your um, meetings recently. And we've talked. And um, yeah, I resonate very much with the kind of evolutionary perspective that you've been developing. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, I mean, I don't really know where we're going um, as a species or anything like that. <laughs> but um, I'm, yeah, I think I'm more more focused on this moment, the present moment. But I also, you know, I think that like you've, you working with John Tarrant, who's a Zen teacher who does a lot of koan work through creativity and imagination. And, and then you, your work has made me realize how much I value the imagination and ideas and things like that, which can get sort of dismissed when there's an emphasis on just being present in the moment and kind of sensory experiencing or dissolving into open boundless presence and that sort of thing. So I don't know if that was clear, but that's kind of what came to mind in the moment. That was inc incredibly clear and multifarious. It felt like you were able to bring together in a, a, a kind of a both and, like when you described the, the two aspirations that you feel. Um, I really like that. I really resonate with that. I think that's... I think that's actually really deep to have that kind of, to not make it, to see how, I don't want to say complex or that, that, that there's an immense simplicity, which is about what's going on. It always feels to me and this extraordinary complexity as well at the same time. And, and I really like both yeah. and I get pulled between the two and, and have those same aspirations in a different way, you know, my own version of that. Is, and and that set and that also that that paradox you brought up right at the start, where I'm acutely aware, probably more aware than anything else, of how profoundly mysterious it is to be a human being, and I don't even know what that means really, and how astonishing it's always been to me since I was a kid that no that so many people aren't. I mean, it just, just like, what? How how are you not? How 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 aren't you constantly like? Ah, you know. um, and and I get why some people find it frightening. I find it quite exhilarating. And at the same time, I'm amazed that we can understand things and give it a go and do our best and move it on. And, and that's the, the paradox for me, Joan, is that at this time in my life, I mean, my emphasis most of my life has been on love and experience and just like, yeah, all right, but let's really get into the feeling that deep connection with each other and with everything and that that communion and then this last 10 years it's been really about philosophy about trying to understand it you know i i kind of did a book called the mystery experience and from then on it's all been about philosophy you know of trying to find a way of understanding it best so how have how would you say it's it's kind of changed for you or, or or when you said you know as you've got older and um it's really changed for me a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. i think it you know well like i said less and less certainty is one thing yeah which is actually big <laughs> and yeah. i mean i can still feel very certain and self-righteous about certain things especially political things but but i'm more and more uncertain about my views on everything yeah and um, so uncertainty and, um, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't really sort of adhere strictly to the Advaita perspective that, you know, everything is like, I've, all, I've never been completely certain that there's anything here that's unchanging. Um, I, I have more gone with the phrase ever present or, right. um, but even that, you know, like it seems to me that everything experienceable disappears every night in deep sleep or under anesthesia. And I feel like 
well, we have kind of different views of death. I mean, I'm not really expecting to be there after death. I think it's going to be more like anesthesia, but I don't know. And it doesn't, you know, I do have a sense that life itself, being itself goes on, you know, and, um, and I'm not, you know, so that doesn't worry me or frighten me or something, but um, yeah, so I never kind of was completely engaged in that Advaita perspective. I mean, I do have this certainly deep sense of just the open boundless presence and the space of awareness in which everything appears, but I've never been certain that that's the nature of reality. You know, that might just be the way the human brain can perceive things, you know, mm -hmm. or something. So I, I've never been, by the way, I never took a single course in philosophy. So, you know, when someone called me an idealist years ago, I was like, I thought they meant that I had ideals or something. And I said, no, I'm not an idealist. <laughs> so I, you know, I've sort of slowly been learning some of these things, but I'm not really versed in philosophy or, but, um, but yeah, so I never, I never completely, and then, you know, Zen sees it very differently. Like the word emptiness even means such different things in different um, approaches. Yeah. Like yeah. in, I really resonate with the sort of Zen view that um, there's really no thing here, you know, because nothing ever actually even forms to be impermanent because the change is so thoroughgoing. And like the, the Indra's net, like everything is just a reflection of everything else. Like all there is is relationship. And, um, you know, the light in here keeps getting dimmer and then lighter again. It's very weird. Or maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's talking about anyway, all these polarities yeah um i did have my covid shot and my flu vaccine yesterday and then have my eyes dilated so i did wake up in a sort of strange like <laughs> but anyway so 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 i i i don't i don't know how much I you you know about what I'm doing at the moment, but one of the see I would see it that, that Zen description that really resonates for me. But it, it's almost like I just want to say it with a slightly different tone of voice. Perhaps is the right thing where it feels like I don't I don't see it as as like empty. It doesn't feel like the right word to me. It feels very full, and it is all relational. And everything is change. Everything is process. The big insight of the 20th century has been oh the universe is a process and it has it's been going on for a length of time and my experience is totally of process everything is process and change and and but that doesn't mean that things don't exist or well it, it doesn't feel it, like that makes them empty the buddhist tradition really pushes that and i don't quite know well why. you know of course different buddhist teachers and schools of buddhism will say all kinds of different things so course, you know i can only course. speak it's, for the buddhism it's like talking about I, christianity isn't it it's yeah like yeah massive. but um my understanding of, of the word emptiness and you know in, in well actually there's a tibetan teacher i've been with who uses emptiness as sort of openness spaciousness uh -huh, but the way uh -huh. the way that most of the um kind of zen teachers i've been with seem to have used emptiness is more like it's not like everything's empty in the sense of a big void or something it's empty in the sense of empty of empty of any kind of permanent solid persisting substantial self it, and not just humans but everything you know there's mm -hmm. no like everything is in flux everything so there you can't ever pin anything down as you know this is this yeah, is something you know, everything I, is so interconnected so you know it doesn't mean emptiness in the sense of um, and, you know, so to me, it's just another way of saying fullness, actually. Yes, but it is a very different term. And obviously, it's a translation. And the, the terms we use can give such a colouring to things. Mm -hmm. You know, because if, if, yeah. it feels very different. You know, when I go, look, everything is relationship. That feels really engaging because I'm in relationship to you. And, and that the Tim isn't a permanent fixed thing. Tim is a permanently changing thing, as a, a, is Joan, as is the sky, as is the earth, as is everything. That feels very affirming of the process of becoming, of the forming of things. And I notice that in the older traditions, and not just in, in the East, but if you go like, like Plato and people like that, there's a real sense that to be real, it should be unchanging. Right. 
Yeah. And 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 that feels a very old sensibility. It's like no, it can be real and changing. That that never made there's... that never made any sense to me. That that use no. of the word real to mean something that's always here. Like why yeah. why isn't this moment real? <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Because everything we've ever experienced has been this flow of time, of change, yeah. of of process. So that seems fundamental. Uh, but the big one of the big changes for me was was and. Then, there's different ways of languaging this, but you talk was was about that the idea of that. Uh, what did you call it? Open, what was open spaciousness, open, open spacious, spaciousness. boundless presence, or something. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, I really get that? It's a you know like uh, we can do it together now. It's lovely, isn't it? It's like whoa, <laughs> and 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 there's been a shift from seeing that as me paying attention to something that I am, that I am this spacious presence, to me paying attention, it is to something I am, but not in the I am awareness, but but rather that there is, well, the, the Zen word works well for me, an isness or a beingness to everything, mm -hmm. and that I'm paying attention to that, and it's a big open spacious presence, and I'm aware of the one thing that makes everything the thing that makes everything one is this shared being that is in the process of becoming all these different relationships so there's a commonality which i which is universal so i'm not focused on anything in particular because everything in particular is a particular process in relationship with the universe or a particular qualities whereas if i if I open that out, I'm a, there's a universal quality which everything has, and the you know all the classic metaphors of the ocean and the waves and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a shift, and 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 I notice a real difference with it, is that with the old way of ideating it, the uh, I I had a sense that it was I was it, but I was kind of on the outside in some way, and that Tim was in the middle of it, but I, I was this kind of empty presence which I got from the a lot of the Eastern stuff and Veta in particular. And now when I do it, it feels much more like Tim is completely embedded in the beingness of everything. And I, mm -hmm. it's a lovely quality of, there is a oneness of which I'm completely a part and moving within, which is arising as you, and you are also completely a part of it. And we're, we're meeting in that flow of, Becoming, 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 which feels intensely creative. Which is why the the creative aspect really fascinates me. Yeah, does I that, really does that make I, sense. Oh yes, and I I completely resonate with that because I think a lot of people in the Advaita Satsang kind of world kind of get stuck in this you know I am empty awareness kind of yeah. perspective that actually feels quite dualistic to me because it's sort of like you know. It's like I'm trying to constantly identify myself as open awareness and not as little me and all that. Um, whereas I, I think it feels much more alive to me to have that sense that I am, that that whatever this is, including you know, aw awareness, consciousness, whatever the. Of course, these words all mean such different things, but anyway. Yeah. Um, but whatever this all is, it's one whole undivided happening that includes it all. And it's not like trying to get into some place of, of detached, you know, emptiness or something in that sense of the word, but, but just um, seeing it at, or being it, experiencing it as one whole undivided happening, really. And yeah, so now the, it's an interesting question, like, what is the self? What is the I? What is the me? You know? Because um, from my own inner perspective right now, I don't really have a strong sense of being somebody. But when I look at you or any other person, I have a, you know, I see everyone as this absolutely unique, incredibly, amazingly unique and beautiful manifestation. And I could say the same thing about every plant, every piece of furniture, everything, you know, but um, especially... Um, the higher life forms like dogs and cats and people and um, but in you know in my inner experience my inner experience you know is very different than like what I 
sort of kind of perceive when I'm looking at someone else, you know, it's more like, um, it's all those things we sort of said earlier about, you know, how, how, how have, how has the view here changed and, you know, what's, what's feeling the feelings and the, you know, it's more like just kind of experience, experiencing, um, a flow of experiencing and, and then I can describe myself in various ways. Like I can tell you my Enneagram point and my, you know, um, yeah. my personality, you know, things and all this kind of thing, but my history, but I'm not sort of experiencing that, you know, inwardly at every moment. It's more like, that's what I, that's more like from it. Do you know what I'm saying here? Is that clear? I, th I think so. I, 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 let me try this on you, Joan, because in some ways, the way I've come to look at it is very common, kind of very commonsensical, or you know, or very obvious. And in another way, it kind of adds a dimension which sometimes I think is missed. In that, that it feels like look, if, if everything, this existence is a process. The universe is a process, and a process is kind of made of made of the past. It's made of you know of what it's been, and so my one of the big ideas that I've been exploring for some time now is that the past doesn't disappear. It's actually implicit in the present so that the past accumulates rather than past. So, so, so our past meetings are all present here. They're all, they're all what's defining what this is and that you're therefore that therefore what is Tim's identity? Well, he's a very, he's a particular psychobiological system, which has arisen amongst in this marvelous universe in relationship to the universe. And he's made of everything he's ever been. The, the, Tim is the past of that relationship. And that informs his every mannerism, his everything about him is informed by every, everything that's ever happened to that psychobiological organism meeting Joan. And Therefore, what I see when I see you is everything that, that Tim is able to perceive of you in terms of how I read you with the senses, but also how I read you with my psyche and my soul, the knowing of you and the sense that we may be connected in those ways, like you said. Uh, and then the same with me. It's like, well, what I see about me depends on what I pay attention to. If I pay mm -hmm. a lot of attention, I can mm -hmm. see lots and lots about me. And, but if I don't, if I'm my attention elsewhere, I see next to nothing about me because I'm not... I'm not focusing that that ability to be conscious, but wherever I focus it, that comes into a vivid high definition, as it were. But that includes me. But what I am is is Tim, and I exist on a, as a psyche, and I exist as a body, and currently they're like that for sure. And that, and I'm I'm kind of made of my past. That's my identity. That's what makes me what I am. And I get very confused now when I look to my own past and also when I'm talking to people who are still involved in um, Neo Vedanta particularly, um, Neo Advaita particularly, is when people are denying a self, I don't really know what the self is that they're denying. Cause I fancy I might agree with them. I, I, Cause it just, it just feels like, what is this funny self that you don't think exists? Yeah. Because you're clearly a psychobiological organism who knows certain things and looks from outside of the eyes, but not out of other eyes. Is there is there any weird thing? Is a self or me or an I that we we need? Are we in? Isn't is isn't it just obvious? Do you know what I'm trying to play with? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, I think um, though you know that like to me, what's kind of illusory about the self is the sense of being separate. Yeah. From everything else okay. and the sense of being you know kind of something solid in a way that we're really not unchanging yeah. solid you know and it's kind of that that sense of that there's a little me in here who's kind of making my choices and authoring my thoughts and Do you, you mean know, like leading. a homunculus a little guy pulling the yeah the yeah, spine? yeah you know but there's like a very strong feeling we have that i'm that i that there's an i here who is having these longings i described earlier or but who is, is you know isn't, and, isn't there uh, isn't there a let's say well, a psychobiological system that's that's arisen from the universe and, and it's having these longings isn't that just obviously true yes yes i would say yes to that um, and I, this is something that I'm still very much, you know, this is a very alive question for me. I don't feel settled in right. this exactly. 
but I do feel like um, that like when I, we, well, this is the whole issue of choice and everything. And when I've explored that, you know, like just watching as choices happen, I can't really find any sort of definable entity who's kind of making them experientially. You know, it's like. But isn't it you? You could. Isn't it that look, 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 Tim, this psychobiological thing that's Tim, is choosing to say this? He's right. not choosing to stop and reflect on it because if he did, he wouldn't, he'd be able to shut up and think about it and then speak. He's just saying it, but he's doing it. He's saying it and it's coming from all the experiences he's had, all the thoughts he's had. And if he wants to, he could stop, think about it and go, is that true? Have a little internal dialogue instead of speaking to you, imagine talking to himself and then could come back and go, actually, I was wrong, Joan, Joan, or Again, it feels, isn't that, isn't that just what, it's like, wh well, why would we have to, most of what we do is unconscious, what, it just happens, but that's still mm -hmm. us doing it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even when you pull your hand away from a hot stove, it's, it's this psychobiological organism, as you're yeah. calling it, doing yeah. that, yeah. based on, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, and then when we choose something, it mm -hmm. just feels like the, the thing, one of the evolutionary things that have made human beings so incredibly successful is exactly our ability to choose. That whereas most of, during nearly all of evolution, there's been none or very little choice, meaning what we can do is I can actually stop and before I just do it, I can imagine doing it or imagine doing different things. Mm -hmm. And then I can choose which of those things actually is the one I want to do, which makes me, you know, and that's on the surface of it, not very helpful because it slows me down. I, I you know, I'm I, much quicker just to respond, but mm -hmm. it, it, but it means I get the chance not to make a mistake mm -hmm. or to learn, to reflect mm -hmm. on what I did before. And so that ability to, to, to apply consciousness to ourselves, not just the world, but to actually focus that high definition processing on our own reactions and responses enables us to change how we ideate, enables us to change how we respond. And that feels like, well, that's hugely important. And who's doing that? Well, I'm doing that. Yeah, well, I would say I'm doing that as kind of an afterthought, you know, like that, yes, it's this psychophysical organism, which is true. Um, and you could also say it's the whole universe doing that because, you know, everything that's here is i see it is dependent on everything in the whole universe tracing back to the big bang or I, I i would i would agree with that but i would yeah. want to say it's the whole universe as tim in relationship to the whole that's doing this and then what you're going to say back is the whole universe as joan right. in relationship to the whole right and that's not and that individuation is not nothing because without that individuation there would be no choice there'd just be gas you know it's like it's that's which enabled us to be like we are which is pretty significant yeah like we there's definitely an ability here to you know identify particular things put them in categories think about them yeah imagine yeah. different possible results and all that sort of thing yeah. um so we may be saying the same thing in different words and i don't actually sort of land on either the no free choice or the choice perspective in terms of like in a dogmatic way because it may be a lot languaging it, but. Um... It's, it feels really important to me because it feels well, there's, there's something, there's a lot of, well, not just in, in science is the same, but there's a lot in spirituality, which seems profoundly misanthropic to me. You know, it seems anti-human and mm -hmm. it passes as wisdom. And I don't think it is wisdom and I don't think it helps us. So it looks to me like that ability to choose to be conscious of our own processing to reflect to imagine new possibilities to change the way we think to doubt our ideation and develop a new one all of that limited as it is because most of it is unconscious i don't even know how to make it conscious but i'm conscious of some of it and i've learned to be more conscious mm -hmm. limited as that may be it just feels really really significant and something to be oh. and which is why i think you know when we've got kids we we you know we don't we would never say to a kid you've got no choice really it just happens 
We would never no. do that, surely. We would no, go, you, would. you have got choice. Now you need to use that. I mean, my dad, the, the thing he said to me more than anything else, which is probably the, why I'm like I am, would be, Timothy, stop and think. Yeah. And it's like that. What, and what that meant was just stop and just reflect on it for a moment. And that seems yeah. not something to be dismissed in any way. No, well, when I speak of no choice from that perspective, it's that all of that is a is a happening of the whole in some way there, that I can't find any little me who's kind of in control of all that. Even the sense of being, let me kind of play this out. Yeah, even, yeah, even, even the sense of being in control or having a choice is happening by itself. My, you know, Tony Packer really invited me to watch as choices were happening and just see if I could find a chooser and I couldn't, you know, all I could find was like, in some cases, just an impulse. And then maybe a thought, a series of thoughts like, Oh, don't do that. Do this instead. And then, or back and forth thoughts like do this, do that, do this, do that. None of which seemed I was in control of there. I mean, there were, didn't seem to be, let me, let me play this out. Tim. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I beg your punch. Yeah. So I couldn't find any sort of sense of, being in control of these different thoughts, although the thought story was sort of that, you know, these are different, you know, there's a me in there somehow. And and then if I was trying to choose between whether to do something or not do it, I found that I couldn't make the decisive moment happen any sooner than it did. I mean, I couldn't, and I wanted to sometimes because it was like driving me nuts that I couldn't decide about something, but I couldn't make that happen until it did. So there was a sense of it all happening in a sense by itself, even the apparent choices and decisions. And now, of course, if, you know, like when I was teaching English at a, at a college, I wouldn't tell my students, you have no choice about whether you do this paper or not, um, or whether you come to class, but we'll see whether you do. Um, or, and if I would, had been raising a child, I wouldn't say you have no choice about you know, I would be talking to them as if they were, you know, when you're in practical sense, you talk to people as if they, you know, like you would tell your child, look both ways before you cross the street. That's really important. But I think what's been so liberating for me about seeing it and seeing the sort of no choice aspect of it is that, well, I have a history of, you know, I, I engaged in, you know, really um, destructive alcoholic drinking in my youth. And you know, shot up drugs and and um, a lot of things, and it didn't feel like I really like it. It doesn't didn't send. I didn't feel like or my finger biting compulsion, which I still have. It's like I can't always. Sometimes it seems I can stop, and then other times I can't. You know, and the helpful thing about sort of seeing the no choice perspective is the elimination of guilt and blame, you know, because when I see that I don't have control over all these things, I also see that other people don't either. So, you know, the child rapist or the, the, you know, the genocidal dictator or whatever, they're also just doing what life is moving them to do. And if they had a choice, they probably, it's, you know, if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't be a child rapist, you know. Um, and then at some point, maybe you do seem to have a choice, like somehow you're able to stop doing that or something. But but um, so there's something in there that feels liberating and important to me in seeing it as sort of a whole happening rather than something that there's a me here that has control over see again i i can't see to where i, I mean I, what you've said i had sympathy with what you said i mean i could find you passages from my books which say exactly that around the guilt around all of it so i mean i really get it i get what you're saying i see why it's attractive but to me now it just seems confused if i'm honest because it feels like when you're looking for the chooser you are looking for the chooser <laughs> it's like well, if you just go well look joan who which is a complex um self conscious biological psychobiological system 
is making all of these choices. You know, it's like you are making those choices, and then you can reflect and watch yourself make the choices. Now, what's happening is the system is looking at itself make choices. Right. And then, if it wants to, it can intervene, which is its superpower. Because it can just let, you know, mostly we but, let our system just happen, don't we? we? I'm not making choices what I do in my arms. They just do it. I'm not thinking what I'm going to say to you. I just trust that I will say the right thing. But if I mess up, I can stop. And then the system can look at itself. And yeah. instead of saying it, I can say it to myself. But there's no but, mysterious chooser. I'm, this is the chooser. It's yeah, been... it's, it's like I, my understanding of like Asian languages is that they don't always have a subject or a self, you know, they, so that, um, you know, some of the, you might just have that whole description as, um, you know, um, drinking too much, looking, evaluating, seeing, wondering, um, you know, without, a, without an eye in there, a subject, you know, just, just, just how they language it, you know? And I, and I think so, it, you know, like we can't, like you said, I can do what I want, but I find that I can't choose what I want. I mean, for example, That's in, right. sto in stopping an addiction, you know, it seems yeah. to me that there's almost always a conflict between between the desire to stop and the desire to indulge. And we can't control I, I, which one is going to be stronger in I, any I, moment. I'm not saying that, the, let me talk about, you know, me, like you've done so beautifully with you. So my addiction was nicotine. I had that and one too. You did have, oh, you've just done better than the addiction. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it, nicotine was for decades. And, um, and of course, but I'm not, I'm not, I, this idea that I don't have any idea that somehow Tim is in control of it. Mm -hmm. Tim has to work hard to, 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 to actually reflect enough that when he goes, I'll just have, no, I won't. I will, no, I won't all of that inner conflict and different parts of Tim, because Tim's a complex, mm -hmm. you know, I'm everything I've ever been. And, and it's complex, but it does feel like, look, there's an identity. I'm doing that. My wife doesn't do that. She's different to me. Right, I, I right, am an individual right. and I, right, I'm right. having that. And she's right. making choices. And sometimes, she, and most of what we do, most of what we do, we don't do consciously in the sense that we don't watch the process thing. And mm -hmm. we, and it's because it's more efficient not to do that. Right. But we can watch the processing and make choices if we want to. And um, we have to fight for it sometimes because we're only learning how to do it still. Yeah. But it seems well, really I... significant. And there doesn't seem any mysterious chooser separate from Tim. Tim is the chooser. I, I think we're saying the same thing in different ways. And I, I think, you know, the argument that you're making is a good argument for using the model of choice and rather than using the other model. Um, and um, yeah, my, actually I, the, the physician therapist that I sobered up from alcoholic drinking with and stopped smoking with back in 1973. 73. <laughs> um, I'd hardly got yeah, started. <laughs> I was smoking three packs of unfiltered cigarettes a day. Mm. Um, so, and cigarettes were the hardest thing to, you know, but yeah. anyway, uh, I remember thinking, why would I want to get up in the morning if I couldn't have my morning cigarette? <laughs> and then I thought, something's wrong with this. <laughs> yeah. But um, but um, she used the model of choice, actually. You know, she she would, in fact, I had to revise, you know, if I said I can't stop, she would have me change that to I won't stop. And, you know, she used the model Ooh. of of Very choice good. you know yeah, she like felt that. the power was not in this in the nicotine or the alcohol or anything the power was in she said the person i might have said awareness but it could be the psychophysical whatever the the power is in yeah i mean what i'm trying to do here all the time joan and it's been that's just been my journey where i've ended up right now but is to so many of the things i was influenced by in the past have this misanthropic quality to them mm, yes i agree like taking taking these things which are so intrinsic to being a human and that simple thing i said about kids was a really big moment for me when i had my daughter particularly so a long time ago now was just taking all the things i was teaching and saying to myself and going would i say that to a kid will i say to my girl you're not really an individual darling would i say <laughs> to her don't be attached 
you know, would I say to her, don't think too much <laughs> and don't get in the mind. And would I say to her, just be in the moment, don't think about the future. I wouldn't say any of those things to her because they'd be disastrous for her. So there was something wrong with all of those ideas. And yet they were in me and I picked them up from these different spiritual traditions and different people. And then it felt, and then slowly and slowly and slowly, I've been filtering them all out and going, how can I keep the deep insight, which might be there, like without losing, with, whilst keeping the, the value of our basic humanity in a very mm -hmm. obvious way. So it's possible, I think, to have that, to go, it's all one, and in one way it is all happening as one, but it's happening as one through all of these or as. That's another one. See, I, do, I make these mistakes all the time. I fall into the old language. So the old language would be the one is happening through Tim as if it's some other thing at the background. Like I'm a uh -huh. puppet. Whereas it feels like, no, no, that's not right. The one as Tim is relating to the one as yeah. Joan. It's uh -huh. not through it. Like, or like it's, you know, look deep inside and you'll find God in the background. It's like, no, it's. And so those things end up if I, by revising all of those things as much as I can, it feels like I'm returning to a sense of, in a, because of the evolutionary picture, it's like th this place that we've evolved to is really beautiful and important and not stopping. It's moving on. Yeah. And, and, our, and valuing our humanity is essential to it. So all yeah. of those, just like science devalues our humanity, oh, you're really just, uh, you know, neurons or you're really just chemicals or my love for my wife is really just hormones and all of that. And uh -huh. it feels like there's truth in all of that. But by framing it in the wrong philosophical language, like the emptiness thing, there's truth in that. But by framing it in negative language, you devalue the most precious thing we've got, which is our evolving humanity. Yeah, I think I, I strongly agree with all that. Um, I guess, um, and you know, the way you sort of summed up, don't think about the future, um, you know, um, I forget all the things you said, but um, those felt to me like sort of almost misunderstandings or, you know, like, which are easily there in yeah. that kind of, like, for example, I would never say to people, don't think about the future, but, you know, there was a time in my life, like where I was obsessed with the future. I mean, and right. I noticed it on my first all day sitting at the Zen center that, wow, every thought is about the future, you know, right. and not in a helpful way, you know, yeah. But like, I was just sitting there thinking, you know, what am I going to do on the break? What what am I going to do tomorrow? You know, what when can I go to my next all day sitting? Um, you know, and it was like, wow. Um, and then noticing over time what was seductive about that, what was appealing about that, and, and the way that it was actually a form of suffering. So it wasn't like, don't think about the future, like don't make intelligent plans or, you know, anything like that. It was, it was that kind of pointer. Um, and um yeah and not not being attached i mean i think you know that's more about again a very misleading language which is what i think you're saying but i think that's it's right. about you know recognizing there's nothing wrong with being attached to your partner <laughs> i mean that seems like a positive thing to me but it's sort of like it's more pointing to the sense that you know i can't be i can only be happy in this relationship or I, you know, I have to have this in order to be happy or be whole or something like that kind of attachment. Um, and, um, but these things are, you know, and I, so I actually really love the way that you're, you're, because I do think we're individuals and I do think that's important. And, and I do think that, um, that emphasizing choice is, I think the better way to go because it empowers us, but I think that the caveat I would have with that is the whole thing about how it can feed into self blame and guilt and blaming yep. others by thinking yep. you have a choice, you know, which is what I thought after I finished my therapy and I had successfully stopped drinking and stopped smoking and all this stuff. I mean, if I hadn't had the finger biting compulsion, which I still do, if I hadn't had that, I would have gone off thinking, well, anybody can sober up. I did it. Look, you just make a choice. <laughs> And you stop, you know, and over the years, I've met many people who have, you know, been trying for years to sober up or quit smoking or something, and they're not successful. And so having that other perspective gives me compassion that I, 
you know, because I don't think it's helpful to be telling somebody you have a choice, you know, you're, you're deliberately doing this or something. It's, it can be helpful. Like when my therapist said, reframe it to, I can't, to, I won't, there was something empowering and helpful in that. It's kind of a balanced thing. I think like there's a bit of both that are needed somehow. My, my sense is more, because I, I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I, I, I really resonate with it. My sense is more, it's like the, the choice, because of this evolutionary picture really helps me with nearly about everything. Because yeah. it was like, look, choice is evolved. Um, you, have to, you have to work at it. And, 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 and you don't just have it. You, you, you evolve it. You find it. You, know, you have to, if you really want to have lots of choice, you have to really, really work at it. To, to make yourself co- conscious of how you process things. Because until you're pro- conscious of how you process things, you can't make the choice. So it feels like we've got limited choice. And I, I probably have more choice now as an old man than I did as a young man. Yeah. Because I've worked at it. Um, it's just that I have the possibility of choosing. And, and because it's important, it feels that it's worth encouraging myself and others to, to extend that ability to make choice. And so I think that, actually, yeah. and, and the biggest thing I'm choosing of, of all the things is where I put my attention. Yes. And, 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 having, I, I, and having the freedom to move it about and not have it f- fixed anywhere, whether it's the past <laughs> or the present or the future, yeah. like that yeah. it can move around. Yeah. And I, 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 I think that that's, um, I like the evolutionary perspective that, that, and you know, when I think about my own life, I mean, clearly the fact that I did therapy several times that went through different forms of psychotherapy, that I did somatic work like Feldenkrais, that I did years of meditation, insight kind of meditation, just watching the mind and all that. What was the last thing you said, Joan? What was the thing before that you did? Feldenkrais, somatic, somatic awareness work. Okay. I don't know. Like where you just, it's called awareness through movement. It's like you're paying attention to very, like, the, the theory was that, for example, if you're reaching for a, something on a high shelf, you may be injuring yourself, but you can develop, you can, it's a form of where you begin to see that, oh, there's other parts of the body that could be involved in that and it would make it easier. Oh. And you're sort of discovering, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I had the, I had that sense when I, at one point I tried taking an antidepressant and I had to go off it because I had a very bad side effect, but it was an amazing experience. It was like, you know, five pound weights had been lifted from me. And, you know, I was just completely transformed. And when I went off it, um, it didn't change. I mean, I, it it never, the depression didn't come back in that way. And it felt like it was, it was that kind of thing where my, I had learned something I had my nervous system or whatever had learned that, oh, there's a different way of being here, you know, just from that brief time that I was on the antidepressant and, and, And that, so that's what I feel like happens through being in psychotherapy, through, through being, doing meditation, um, doing somatic body work and taking an antidepressant. I mean, it can happen in all kinds of different ways Um, that we are. I liked how you said it. We are essentially developing more possibilities and evolving and. The um, somatic thing. I'm really pleased. I picked, I I asked you what that was because um, I didn't, I hadn't heard of it, but it's a great example example i think of what we've been discussing in a very tangible way so um i'm i've never been very sporty or physical i used to do a lot of tai chi at one stage but it was i mean i got it, I, it was hard for me i you know and and i over the, this this last period i've started doing um weights which was the last thing that i thought i'd ever do in the whole of my life with a young guy and i go two or three times a week and carry these lift up these things for no purpose and put them back down again and um what's interesting the reason i bring it up is he will say do this with your back use that muscle and i've got no idea what he's talking about and he, i have to learn to choose to use that muscle right. because i just do it as tim does it and he goes no 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 not like that use that yeah. muscle and eventually yeah. i go oh oh that one i got it yeah and the same, and it feels like that's the same with the psyche. It's like, yeah. learn to respond in that way, not in that way, Tim. Oh, oh, I see. And then my ability, so now he, he says, use your lats. I can choose to use my lats because I know how to pull them. I know where they are. But I didn't know where they were. And so that's the extension in a physical way um, to something that's happening psychologically as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
and it, it, you know, just even that we become can become more aware of different parts of our body that before they just even weren't there. Like you, you would try to feel that part of your body and you just get a blank. And then I, all I think of a sudden, it was all of the body. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, the more you sort of attend to it, yeah. um, eventually you begin to get, Oh, a little sense of it. And then more yeah. sense of it. And, um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, so I like the idea that that um, that we're evolving because that actually does um, include the sense of not not feeding into guilt or blame because exactly. it's like you know yeah. I'm this the world through Joan the world as Joan the you know the like being as Joan whatever is evolving but there are certain ways that it hasn't evolved yet and so. Yeah you know, sometimes she bites her fingers and loses her temper and doesn't seem to have the ability to control that yet. Yeah. And um, she aspires to in some way, but it just doesn't always seem to work. And that that, that would be exactly how I see Tim. <laughs> like, that, and, and also it helps with other people because I realize, well, I think the thing I really, I really, the thing which gets me the most is, you know, I feel when I look at my life now, having sort of lived a life for, not as long as you, but pretty long, is I, I feel I've been very lucky. I've had a, an awful, it's been, my life has been a, 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 a fortunate life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I can find myself so unconscious, having been this fortunate, makes me think, wow, if people who are, having a, who, who, are, who are not fortunate, it must be really tough. And people who don't have the opportunity and the time that I've had to self inquire and do all these right. things. Yeah, so my, my sense of blame of others is, it's like, no, is every, everyone's in a different place evolving. And the most we can do is encourage each other. I mean, sometimes you have to stop people doing things, of course, but the general sense I have is you know, that, that, that that's pointless, that we need to support each other in becoming more conscious because it's better for you it's better for me you know yeah that really resonates and i i also feel that i've had an incredibly lucky life you know i had wonderful parents and yeah um and i've had a great deal of time to do things like meditation and yeah. and you know yeah um spend five years of my life on staff at a retreat center um you know doing 10 silent retreats a year and all that kind of Ooh, thing you know my it's, goodness me. like yeah and, you know, being paid a pittance for doing it, you know, which, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I was able to do that, you know, yeah. um, if I had been, if I hadn't had any sort of, like, I had financial help from my parents and, and, you know, I wasn't raising children and, and that I had to support. And there were so many variables in there that enabled me to take it, you know, to be in a position like that or, or to you know spend time studying Feldenkrais, you know the awareness through yeah. movement, or or yeah. be you know. So yeah, I feel like I've had a very lucky life, and and I also just feel like you know we're all different mixtures of nature and nurture and genetics and everything else. We all have different weather systems, like different cities, you know, and and oh, everybody's... I love that analogy. That's fantastic. Yeah, That's <laughs> and brilliant. and it, yeah, and we're all just working with you I know what that. we have, you know, and. And, you know, like we wouldn't be mad at, at um, Chicago for not being as sunny as Berkeley or something. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. I love that. I love that as well. I also love it because, I mean, this is a different subject, but that thing you were saying that we're connected, my, my, my sense very much is that just as I, I exist within a biological ecosystem, the, the psyche it exists in a psychological ecosystem and we're all as connected in that non-spatial imaginal realm as we are here. And the, the interesting thing with that is that even though you're on in another continent physically, I can feel like you're right. I'm right there with you because the psyche is not anywhere. It's not spatial. So it's so yeah. we're very close up there. And the, the thing I liked about the weather system, that's the whole thing, we, but the, there was just that idea that I also see us go through collective things where, where everyone's yeah. moving like, oh, yeah. But each person, like a city, has its own microclimate. It's like yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. it's within a general sort of climate. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Yeah, and it's so true. I mean, we're like, we are like right here in this same, whatever this is, you know, I don't feel yeah. like we're thousands yeah. of miles apart or something. I know, it's I mean, mad, just, isn't it? in different time zones and all that yeah. you know it's it's like i don't feel that yeah like right here 
and clearly we're connecting on what you call the imaginal level, you know, the, yeah. the, um, you know, and, and obviously we're, I mean, even just learning language, we're learning a whole, that, that in itself is a whole imaginal structure yeah. that we're learning. Yeah. And, and, um, so we are all, and then certainly we, we, so many ideas, you know, memes and all that sort of thing. So many ideas that float around out in the, whatever, <laughs> In the, uh... So the big thing that tell me if you've been if you've done this or or uh, yeah I'm sure you probably have you've done so much but there's the, um one the, the thing which is the experiential thing that I've been exploring for the last twenty years about that is what happens when people have the opportunity to commune soul to soul psyche to psyche in profound ways and. So what I do at my retreats is to, first of all, make people, everyone feel safe and they can relax and be themselves. You know, they can be their own microclimate. That's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and then build up to a thing where they're connecting, the, usually through gazing, but not just through gazing. In a really beautiful, you know, I set up something. I think beauty is really important. And beautiful music can really help. And just, I think beauty is very transformative. So I create a, a, an enchanting space. And then I just get them connecting with one person after another, after another for about an hour. And they'll connect with everyone who's present. And that's where that feeling of we're right up close, like now, just deepens and deepens and deepens. And, and I think people are so shocked by the experience. That they they that have just what like, that happens to them just when they look at another person without speaking and just look, <laughs> and they do that for three minutes and then do it another three minutes with somebody else and then somebody else and then somebody else and then somebody else and by the end it's they're so in communion they're so in oneness, um, and that really intrigues me because it's so relational. Because when I was coming through, and I still liked to meditate on my own and, you know, close my eyes, and I love all of that, and it's very important to me. But that ability where we meditate on each other, if you like, where we connect with each other, just feels so beautiful and transformative. And I wondered if you have what your thoughts are on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I completely resonate with that. Um, Tony Packer had got into having dialogue groups as part of retreat where we'd, you know, have a dialogue. Um, it wasn't exactly the sort of more warm and fuzzy thing, but it was, it was, it was because there was, but that's a whole other story, but, but, you know, it was about, you know, really listening to each other and watching and seeing what pushed our buttons and how we, you know, responded and all that sort of thing. And, and then I had two different teachers who used eye gazing um, the first was Joko Beck, Charlotte Joko Beck, who was a Zen teacher. And she had on her retreats, we did a 40 minute period every day with one partner in which we would sit, you know, knees to knees, really in the sitting position and um, gaze into the other person's eyes. And for me, that was that it was um, it seemed to be for me a lot about being seen, having the experience of being looked at, being seen. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I. I, I just had an incredible emotion um, yeah. that, that it brought up of, I think, um, and then the other teacher um, who was a kind of wild, wild character named Natone, um, she had us do eye gazing kind of in the way you're saying it was shorter periods, like maybe five minutes or something. Yeah. And then we'd move on to another person and we'd circulate yeah. around. And by then it wasn't feeling uncomfortable it, for me. It wasn't sort of whatever was brought up by feeling I was being seen, but um, but it was um, just the experience of just gazing into somebody's eyes and seeing how utterly different everybody was to gaze at, you know, or to in commune yeah. with in that way. And yeah. um, and then I I recently did watch one of the things that you've sent me, you know, from your 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 meetings, in which there was gazing, and I I was thinking, well, this can't possibly work on on Zoom. Um, and I was very surprised that, um, you know, as each face, you brought each face up into the, into the, you know, the view and just looking at each different person as they came up was such a powerful and beautiful experience because they were all so completely unique 
and so beautiful. Like when you really look at someone in that way, just completely looking at them, you, you just see their, their beauty and their, their vulnerability and their open, you know, you just see the person in this deep way. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was very moving and obviously very moving to everyone who was there, you know, it was, it was clear. And, um, so I think that's that seeing the beauty is so such a big thing, isn't it? That that yeah. shift. This, when, yeah. you talked, when you started off about the presence, it's like it comes with that, doesn't it? Here's what I want to ask you, Joe. Here, here's the thing. Do you? I mean, and I've no idea how you're going to respond to this. I don't think. <laughs> um, when when I well, it's all the time now, I guess, in some little way. But when I really go into that presence my intuition now and it was right from the start is that i'm communing in something greater than me mm -hmm. that there's something there is something that my soul is inside some other greater presence and and i guess the traditional name for it would be god but let's just call it that the, the benign presence or something that that and 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 that feels really significant as well in how I understand this journey I'm on. That I that that that, that feels real to me. And mm -hmm. I wondered, it does again like emptiness doesn't work for me for that reason because it feels like no, it's it's just full of this divine, loving presence. It's not. It's it's full of that. And yeah. Do you do you, do you know do you get that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, tuning into presence in that way, it's like, you know, yeah, you feel like you are the whole universe, you know, yeah, it's really yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, I remember just when you're like being on meditation retreats at Springwater, Tony Packer's place where we did all these, you know, silent retreats at the end of, you know, we didn't look at each other during retreat, except maybe during the dialogue groups. But, you know, the whole thing was that you don't make eye contact. And then at right. the end of retreat, it was like everybody was washed clean in this amazing way, like people who had been fighting with each other before the retreat, all of a sudden, everybody's faces were just so open. And there was just this immense love, oh. you know, and, um, and I would experience that during satsangs, you know, with you know, when I'd go to satsangs with different teachers, you know, there would just be this incredible love in the room yeah. and amongst people. And really this kind of, um, I could call it bliss, you know, bliss and yeah. love and, and that just permeated the room. Yeah. And yeah. And you felt like you were just, you feel like you are this whole, you are, you know, it's, it's like, and I think we sort of, you know, that's, that's not always there. I mean, sometimes there's more of a feeling of being, you know, sort of, <laughs> you know, me against that's the a, world. <laughs> that's a great description. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that, that captures it perfectly. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, all you have to do is like read some political article or something. And then yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, you go into this other, place this sort of and then it's just you yeah all of that dissolves and yeah and um and uh yeah politics is another subject that we have connected on a bit it is it is because we've both been changing on that as well so. we've been changing on that and and it's a big question for me like just even how much attention i want to give to the sort of political realm um mm -hmm because first of all i feel like it is a very it's the kind of realm where you know there it tends it it, it tends to produce that kind of contracted <laughs> separate conflicted experience and um on the other hand it does feel like in some way it's important to engage with it to some degree because it's part of what's going on you know and so I'm kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a big question mark for me, like how much attention I want to give to it, you know, in terms of what I read and look at and, and also how yeah. much I want to talk about it um, at all. I find my, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And especially because often it feels like, although one could say, as you did, and I agree with you, you know, well, it's happening and, you know, we should be involved or not should, but we can be involved yeah. in our collective situation. Why wouldn't you be? But I'm also aware that Tim has very little influence on it really. And that my, 
I can, I, if I focus on it too much, it's almost as if there's a frustration that it's actually, that I'm in I'm not engaging with my life. I'm engaging with other people's lives and I can't do anything yeah. about that. And, but I, I feel, I think for me, it's been actually a lot to do with just seeing how I was ideationally blind. You know, I couldn't see things in myself. That, that thing mm -hmm. you said about choice, I, it's like, wow. I, I had these opinions for all my life and I couldn't see what was wrong with them. But now it's so obvious to me. That's amazing, isn't it? And, and that, so what else am I doing that with? And that's been the fascination with it and how, and then I'm fascinated by the news because it keeps showing me that. I keep seeing yeah. something happening and noticing I've got a completely different reaction now to that. Yeah. And whereas I would be going, that's great. And that's terrible. It's now the opposite perhaps, or, or certainly neither, you know, like, I don't know, they look the same or, and that is pretty full on, isn't it? <laughs> Doing that yes. And yes. And I've been having the same experience. I mean, you know, I think it started back around 2013 when I started to notice that the, news coverage of the Black Lives Matter events was quite dis that I was tuning into left wing, you know, and mainstream liberal media. And I started to notice that the coverage was kind of distorted often. And, and, you know, and I think that was the beginning for me of starting to question some of it. Um, and not to go into specifics or anything, but I began to question more and more. And I found now I'm listening to lots of in different perspectives, like, yeah. I started listening to people like Tucker Carlson, whom I had completely yeah. demonized as this horrible yeah. person. And yeah. I still disagree with him on many things. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, there's a lot I'd say, oh, well, that's really good, actually, you know, and, um, and, you know, reading, um, what's his name? Um, the um, black, he's black, he's, um, he, he was raised by Marxists, but now he's a conservative. Um, Thomas Sowell? Uh, or... Thomas Sowell, yeah. I'm reading his book, yeah. How Liberalism Fails, or something like that right now. Tom I can't remember. He's a, he's something like that. Ordinary writer. And, yeah. And, you know, I've disagreed with him on some issues, you know. I mean, we, you know, yeah. so it's not like I now completely agree with him, but it's yeah. he's he's writing about these things in such from such a different perspective than I have looked at them, because I've spent basically my whole adult life in the left bubble. And yeah. um, and what's become so interesting is just how different, you know, like both sides see the other side as, you know, the biggest danger to democracy, the, you know, toxic, yeah. Um, corrupt, yeah. Um, yeah. dangerous. Um, like a mirror, isn't it? It's yeah. Like, and they... And no self, that, that kind of lack of... Surely you can sense the irony in what you're saying because you're saying you're saying what you're actually doing and vice versa. And yeah, funnily enough, I mean, I can't remember how we, much we talked about this before, but um, the Black Lives Matter was a big thing for me, which is even odder because I'm an Englishman. I'm, I'm, I live in the southwest of England. It's really not a big issue and it's happening in America. But the way it was, again, being done by the mainstream media here I'd never saw, seen it. It was like this is, this is actually strange. Part, partly because they've been condemning people madly for going out, not obeying the COVID restrictions, which I understood why they might do that. But then when everyone came back in protest, it was like, well, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and it's like, what? And that made me start questioning. And then listening to Sam Harris's broadcast on that, which was incredibly insightful, and just going, oh look so much of this isn't true. And then once you start picking at that, suddenly I, I could see my own way of thinking had blinded me to seeing other perspectives. And then like you discovered, and funnily enough, Thomas Sowell was one of them of just going, actually, this guy's really smart. He's kind, he's thoughtful. W what's not to listen to? And, and like you, it doesn't mean I agree with him necessarily about everything but it's made me less certain of things that I was certain of before, because I can hear he's not a bad man serving the interests of corporate greed. He's, you know, he's a thoughtful co co commentator on the human condition who thinks that things that I thought were the solution have actually caused immense problems. And that's worth yeah. considering if I'm going to be an intelligent person. And, 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 and the shock really is like being so doing it so old, feeling like, wow, I've been in that, that particular bubble all my life and, yeah. and well there's the collective thing i have many friends 
of my own age who are going through exactly the same thing. It's a collective thing. It is, that, yeah. That, that people have been going, oh, I'm just waking up from being in my particular bubble. And my, and my hope is, you know, because I'm terribly optimistic, despite everything, my hope is that, well, it combines with the thing we were talking about earlier about that love and that feeling mm -hmm. of connection, that, that the, the level of polarization we've got at the moment and, and the kind of m monological v uh, blindness, I can only see my point of view and I can only see my, that, that it's got so absurd that more and more people are going through this where they're going, well, not that, actually you're the same. And that opens up a new way of connecting and, and being more thoughtful and yeah. respectful and kind. And I and, hope and, that's uh, true. You know, I don't have, too. I don't, I you don't. know, you're one of the few people <laughs> that I know. I have a few other friends in my life who are going through something similar, right. but it's not a lot. Most of my friends, you okay. know, are, you know, yeah, liberal yeah. Democrats who completely believe in the Democratic Party and the left agenda, wokeism and all that, you know, and, yeah. um, and um, it's, uh, yeah, and the same stuff. I mean, you look, people on the left are like, oh, they're censoring all these books on the right. And then the left is censoring all this stuff. I you know, know. but like, they don't see, see that. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, and it's like, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. so it's... Uh, it's been a very, very interesting, um, interesting thing to find myself. I had a moment with one of my friends that's going through it, which, you know, because I'm very aware also that it feels we have a tendency, I mean, we human beings have a tendency to focus on the negative for a good reason, because the negative is dangerous to us. You know, mm -hmm. everything's fine. You don't want to focus on that. You want to focus on the one thing that could cause a problem. So we're very good at that. And we do that collectively as well. And it leads to this very pessimistic view often where everything's going wrong. And what, what, what I find interesting as someone who studies history a lot is that it looks to me like every generation throughout the whole of history has thought everything's going wrong. And yet, actually, there's been a tendency, not always, but in history, for things to get better and better and better and better and better, until here we are now, living a life which even the rich in the past couldn't possibly have dreamt of. And yet we still think everything's going wrong. So I'm aware of that tendency and wanting to counteract that and have a gratitude towards the people who've been before that have enabled me to have such a magical life. And not just me, everyone is doing generally much, much better. But... I'm, and, and, and so I don't want to slip into, oh, you know, politics is just getting more polarized than ever. Because I remember the 70s and we had uh, me too. Right? And it's like and it was pretty polarized and, you know, and all of that. But he, so, I, you know, and it's not it's not like, you know, we haven't got the we haven't got the cultural revolution. It's not, <laughs> we're not we're not we're not facing that kind of monstrous self-destruction that, that happened in China, say, or elsewhere. But he said something which did make me stop and go, he, he said, yeah, he said, you're right, Tim. Yeah, it's good not to exaggerate that. But he said, throughout my life, I've never, ever before self-censored and worried about what I was going to say in public. But now I do. Oh, and yeah. I thought, yeah, and so do I. Yeah. In fact, in fact, if I'm honest, I'm doing it now because I'm aware that this is not a conversation necessarily just between the two of us. It's a yeah. conversation other people may see. Yeah. I am in the background being very careful about what I do and don't say because of the level of vitriol, which I'm aware is out there and the effect it's having on people that speak out of turn and that, that trying to close people down and, and, and not allow free expression with the faith that if we allow each other to say what is inside of us, we can find a way of meeting and finding the best from that interaction rather than yeah, no, down the other. It's very disturbing, you know, the level in which the, the whole sort of cancel culture and, and, you know, um, Paul, I was just reading this morning, Colin Hughes, who's another um, young brilliant. black man who's a brilliant man and someone I listen to. Yeah. Um, his TED talk is apparently, I mean, I didn't read the whole article, so I, but you know, he's being maybe censored by it because he argues for 
colorblindness, by which he doesn't mean that, you know, he's denying that there's something called racism, but yeah. he doesn't think the way to to heal it is the current approach. And, yeah. uh, you know, and there are many people like Shelby, uh, not Shelby, um, why am I not getting this guy's name? The one we both read. Soul? Um, Thomas Soul. Thomas Soul. And there is a guy named Shelby Steele, who I think I've also read, but I can't even remember who he is right now. But also John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry. I mean, there's a number of Black intellectuals who have a very different view. Um, and and then the whole question of gender and how that's being dealt with. And literally, I mean, people are in the gender war, you know, calling for physical violence against people who question the the agenda, the dominant agenda, even from a place of being very sympathetic to many aspects of it, you know? And um, yeah, so it is, and yeah, self-censoring, it's, it's, but, uh, you know, there is something about, it's really, you know, it's kind of funny to be old because <laughs> I think it does give you this longer perspective and, and I agree that we've gotten better and better throughout history, but at least in most ways, but um, the technology has made some things worse or social media has made some things more exaggerated, but overall it's been, but, you know, I hear young people saying stuff about, you know, how absolutely unbelievably painful it is to grow up gay, um, you know, in, in the seventies or something. And I'm like, in the seventies, I was doing it in the fifties. I mean, you know, like <laughs> that's your idea of pay, you know, and it's like, you know, it's it's just like and I realized that when, when I was young, that's what I thought. Like the world is terrible, you know, we're the first generation that's ever, you know, wanted to do anything about this. And, you know, that yes. seems to be the role of the young, you know, and yes. it's part of, you know, it's part of but then you get old and you see, well, wait a minute, I've been through this before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like the the polarization, which, you know, during the Vietnam War, it was very polarized, you know. Yeah, um, really good it was example. Really, really, yeah. Good. And so it's not like any of this is exactly new. And, uh, and I know that I've had a tendency to fall into kind of apocalyptic thinking, doom and gloom, apocalyptic thinking, you know, the world's yeah. ending and all that. And, and it may, I mean, at some point it will end because everything ends at some point, <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, I'm really trying to sort of catch that now, like, like I'm trying to make a choice. <laughs> I'm trying to catch that now, you know, that sort of tendency to fall into doom and gloom and, you know, the yeah. world is ending. Because um, yeah. I, you know, and also that's another thing about being old. Like I can remember listening to people like John C. back in the, you know, seventies or something, maybe even earlier, talking about how we only had ten years, and if we didn't get it all together in ten years, you know, it was too late. And then ten years later, it was like, well, we only have ten years if we don't get it together in ten years. And then you know, yeah. somehow, and then there was peak oil, and there, you know, there was the ozone yeah. and all these different things. Yeah. And you've been through all these things, and then you find the world is still here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's... so somehow it feels like what we're looking to do. This is where I've got to anyway. Is is we're learn we're we're what what we have is the ability to process things in this amazing way, and we just need to get better at it. And we've got better at it, but we need to get even better at it, significantly better at it. And the way we treat, see each other, the way we meet the way that I ideate meets how you ideate. We we need to work. We need to take that to a new level. Yeah. And and the 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 reason that I want to try and frame what seems the really valuable side of spirituality in a in a human positive way is it feels like that 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 that's a, a real secret to it. Because when you look when you described it was beautiful, you know, a little while back before we moved into politics and you were talking about how beautiful people look and that love and that connection and how they you know, it, it's like yeah, so that's that's what we need. And then when you've got that, you can look at people who were previously unthinkable and connect with them. It's like I I, I have pictures of people that I found really difficult in the public sphere, which I bring up every now and again and, and look at just to get mm, to the point where I'm like yeah. sitting with them. It's like, oh, there they are. And <laughs> and, and and not that, oh, you know, and, and that's been another really interesting thing for me, Joan, and you kind of touched on it, I think, when you mentioned Tucker Carlson, is that, um, and I probably see him differently because an Englishman, he's very American phenomena, but, but 
there is I what I noticed was that I had a visceral um what's the word I'm looking for a, a, a kind of a a real what's the word I don't know there's a word for it but that 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 distaste with mm-hmm. say someone like Donald Trump and also mm-hmm. people around him and probably someone like Tucker Carlson to the degree that I I saw him was like oh just like why I, I i really and then what intrigued me was that other people were having the same visceral reaction to people i really liked and it's like <laughs> well, what's going on there and then finding now i don't have that visceral reaction now to any yeah. of those people i don't they're all just people to me i don't I, i've lost that Ugh, thing which was because i couldn't so my hope is that the that even if it's taken me up to my 60s if i can do it then then maybe it'll happen more generally i don't know how long it'll take but that it's pushing us to open up into another level of humanity and and the, I, the, and yeah and 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 that would be just so good in every way because you know i think to take donald trump as an example you know i think the the antagonism to him pushed him to do some things that he might not otherwise have done you know and similarly uh it's kind of like what well what happens to each of us individually you know like if somebody if somebody hates me and meets me with you know thinks i'm a disgusting person and and you know treats me that way how do i respond you know mostly it kind of brings me into that contraction and you know fighting back yeah. Whereas when somebody loves me and sees me compassionately and generously and all of that, it opens my heart. And, you know, um, yeah. And a, and a big, a big thing, and this kind of relates to right where we started was it, the, the way I phrase it is it kind of, it, it's both and uh, paralogical, both and rather than either or. So like when you, when you went through and went, when I said that thing about um, uh, detachment and, and 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 only paying, not thinking about the future, and you went, well, that's all misunderstanding. And of course, you're completely right. That's exactly right. And what you effectively did was go, well, you, it's both of those, isn't it? You know, you don't want to be so stuck about thinking about the future. You never go, wow, this is the moment. And you don't want to be so stuck in the moment. You go, oh, sorry, I completely forgot that I should have been there on Thursday. Or, you know, the, it's always both. <laughs> It's like the thinking yeah. mind, you know, how lovely that you can talk to yourself. How awful yeah. if you just talk to yourself. It's just like, you know, I am really enjoyed our conversation, but I sh- probably I think I could speak for both of us that if we had to keep talking to each other on and on and on and on, there would come a time quite quickly where we'd had enough. And it'd yeah. be like, oh, I can't talk to Joan any longer. It's been eight hours, you know, and and like so it's both it's always both now you need some silence now you need some aloneness now you need to and and life is so obviously like that now you need to rest now you need to eat now you and 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 with all of it it feels like if we can get how you can hold both at once so the fact that you can be open to someone doesn't mean you necessarily agree with them doesn't mean you won't passionately disagree with them Mm -hmm. but you're still able you don't have to choose between those two you can Mm -hmm. actually be there with somebody and go oh i see it differently and this is why and so i'm 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 hoping we can i think again it's the sense of history it's like we've moved so far we don't realize how far we've moved yeah well well the the example that always comes to me is here am i i think having this lovely conversation with you you're a woman i'm a man and it hasn't occurred to me once during the whole conversation that's remotely relevant to our conversation. I can say the same. (laughs) Yeah. And that's historically unprecedented. You know, uh, George Eliot had to call himself George and fight to get a conversation like this. Yeah. But we just do it. Don't think anything of it. It's like, and how lovely that is. It's a huge distance we've come. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I think about, you know, I mean, I grew up in the 50s. I was born in the 40s, grew up in the 50s. you know, I mean, in terms of all these things, racism, sexism, heterosexism, you know, we have come an enormous distance. It doesn't mean all these things are completely resolved and there's nothing further, but we've gone so far. Um, And I mean, it really an unimaginable distance. I mean, growing up, I could never have imagined that we'd have a black president or that gay marriage would be legal in my lifetime or any of that, you know? I couldn't have imagined it. Yeah. 
and and um well i could have imagined it but it would have been like you know forget it <laughs> yeah and that, and so that's the i want to capture that feeling imagination yeah yeah i want to also. capture that feeling for now so the things that we can feel like oh yeah right you know maybe <laughs> people will be like that it feels like well that's what we felt a few decades ago about this and right, now we've done yeah. it yeah yeah it's it's a bit like when i want to go there's a big jump and i don't want to get into it but when i say things like i think the the psyche or the soul has evolved to be able to survive the death of the body and to continue continue in the imaginal and that's what's happening after death that's what i think in near death experiences my my feeling always when it's like well that doesn't sound very unlikely does it is it look we are here having this conversation but human beings have evolved from fish it doesn't seem very likely does it but they have so if if, if human beings can evolve from fish is it really that unlikely to think that the psyche could evolve in such a way that it's able to maintain itself in a an imaginal dimension it's not it, it shouldn't be ruled out as just ridiculous so all of so what i'm trying to say with all of this is as we realize how far we've come from fish to us or from the 50s to now let alone the middle ages till now <laughs> and witch burning and you know, jesus yeah. christ it's like if we can see that then those are grounds for the optimism which yeah. can make us go okay let's imagine it better and then the people that do that will create it better I remember like reading. Done before. I remember reading Jules Verne in the fourth grade, and the teacher saying, "You know, this is completely science fiction fantasy." I mean, she said, "You know, people are never actually going to go to the moon, or, uh, you know, that is completely impossible." But, um, you know, and with not that many few years years later, we were on the yeah. moon. You know, yeah. and and yeah, I mean, um, well, you've definitely made me more open. <laughs> to the perspective that um, what you call the soul could continue beyond after death. I mean, I didn't have a, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, I'm very aware that I don't know I haven't died, you know, so. I, I, I don't and, know either. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, it, it's certainly like, um, you know, I like the way you sort of talk about how, and not that you haven't done it in this conversation, but how, you know, kind of like things evolve from, I forget how you called it information to, you know, yeah. like hydrogen or something physical and then biological and then human consciousness and the imaginal and, you know, yeah. and I can see that. And uh, so, you know, it's who knows what goes on or what's possible. Well, I look forward in a few decades time, not too quickly to kicking back in the, afterlife and <laughs> chewing it chewing it over and going what do you make of it from this perspective joan <laughs> yeah and seeing what it, seeing what it looks like then i do hope might... so. the, i mean the the idea i think this you know this is just fun but it kind of real in the the idea that you could possibly go through this experience of being alive and then have no debriefing whatsoever it's just like have a very strange experience for 70 years 80 years and then stop <laughs> it's like that what <laughs> that just feels like so absurd that would be it's hard to well but it seems to me that it's you know whether we have the individual soul or the or the sort of holes i agree i agree. you know that that it's not like i mean there is a debriefing it's the debriefing like we're debriefing what you know my parents generation went through in a sense you know yes like, yeah very good i like that. you know and it's like sort of that. like that's true too that is definitely true something definitely doesn't end something continues but yeah, yeah. i don't know exactly what it is you know yeah and yeah, um, yeah. and that's important like, in itself just that yeah like we might not be tim and joan <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah although although if you have that sense of identity as a as a as a process uh -huh. then if the process continues that's exactly what we'll be we'll be more than that because the uh -huh. process will have continued but we'll be we will we will contain within us you know this moment this is now in us we exist in, in within each other because we've met in this way and that will be there forever because it's happened and yeah, there's something I mean, beautiful about that. 
No, I do. I do see that. Yeah. I mean, in a way, the past, I mean, I often say the past is completely gone, but it's also here. It's also yeah. here. And, yeah. and I, you know, um, I often use the example of music, you know, if all we had was the present moment and we were listening to music, all we'd have is, uh, you know, that and then in order, in, in order for music to make any kind of sense and be beautiful, we have to remember what happened and we have to have some anticipation of what's coming next. That's part of what makes it music and the same with the story or a play or anything, movie, anything like that, you know, in, a lar in or, our or life, a, you could say. A, a sentence, eh? You know, a sentence, think, yeah. I, I, that's the one that always gets me when people say, time is an illusion. I go, but I only understood that sentence because of time. <laughs> because yeah. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been the past to enable me to know what the last word meant. Or as you say, not even a word, just a syllable. Or not even yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So it has been a delight to meet in this process with it you. Definitely has. I mean, I really love talking to you, Tim. And I, you know, it just like opens me up in many, many ways that I really deeply appreciate. Yeah. Oh, I'm so pleased because I, I feel that too. It's been lo really lovely to, yeah, to explore and to debrief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>